Good afternoon. Uh, now Lincoln uh, University through Cooperative Extension is presenting uh, the webinar on, on the small ruminants. Our invited speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Buckman, he will be talking about uh, COVID-19 and all the things that you have to know about the livestock here. So we welcome Dr. Chris Bachman and we ask uh, to him to present by himself. Thank you, Dr. Salinas. And good morning, can you hear me okay? Yeah, All right. Yeah. All right. Um, so like I said, I'm Dr. Chris Bachman. Um, I'm a veterinarian. I graduated from the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine in uh, 2001. Uh, so I've been in practice I was in practice, just in practice for about 18 and a half years. I've been with Lincoln for about a year and a half. Uh, and I still do a little practicing, looking at stuff on the side. And, and today we're going to kind of address some of the uh, issues with, with COVID. We know it's come in and been an issue. So you want me to go ahead and share my screen and get started, sir? All righty. Okay. Don't know if that showed up for you guys or not, but it didn't quite show up right for me. All right, does that look all right? Yeah, you're good. All right, it had a, it got angry about something for a minute, so. Um, so we'll kind of move on. So I, I changed around these slides a little from a couple of times. I, I've talked about this and I thought we would start today at least kind of on this slide. And most of this information is taken from the CDC and from the American Veterinary Medical Association of kind of what you need to know as far as what we know right now. And so we'll start with some assurances, I think for everybody. And right now, while they don't know the exact source the horseshoe bat is kind of thought to be the most likely case of where this uh, SARS coronavirus came from. Um, it, it's not 100% sure, and we think there's probably an intermediate host or another animal that kind of acted in that this time. Um, but based on what we know so far, the risk of our livestock species uh, becoming infecting, uh, infected and spreading this disease uh, is very limited and not a huge concern at this time. Um, while that there's a, a fairly good likelihood we may not know some of the real impact and, and concerns of it for maybe a, a few years, I think, potentially for me, at least a year or two. Uh, at this time, it takes some very specific circumstances anytime we've seen spread of COVID-19 to people or from people to animals. And so while we know we need more studies and we'll have to start doing some surveillance, at this time, there's just not a huge concern of the spread of the virus to our livestock species. And then we'll talk a little bit more about it's not just spreading to them, but does it really do anything and where does it go from there? So at this point, it's just not a, a ton of concern, but again, some limited information we have at this point. Still, most of our resources are out trying to deal with the human side of it. And so we may just be a little behind the curve as far as knowledge for, for a while. The other slide I'll throw up that I think are questions we'll ask and, and we'll talk about it more at the end, but when we talk about, so what if it does show up in, in any animal uh, that may be at our place, even if it's not just the livestock, but if we're using cats to help control rodent issues or uh, if we have working dogs or <clears throat> maybe some of these livestock species we have function more as pets. So if you have a goat yoga place, uh, a few of the things we'll look at is one, do the animals I have, are we concerned they're going to be at risk to, to get the disease and have any actual infection occur? And if so, will it cause any signs of disease? So even if they have it going on where we actually see symptomatic issues that occur. Thirdly, even if they develop symptoms, can they spread that disease on? Or does it just stop at that animal? Do they possess enough uh, of the disease properties for it to move along to another animal of the same species? And then fourth, could it go to a different one? So there's a lot of steps that, that could be involved that we'll look at uh, just beyond 
could they be exposed and show any replication? So as a, as a kind of brief overview, I think we want to talk a little bit about viruses and, and immunology and have some understanding. And while it may not be super important for what you do for risk mitigation or dealing with your, your current livestock issues, it, it may be important as we talk down the road about how do we start to find out or what do we do as control measures um, to look into the virus and see if it's important. So a virus is basically just some genetic material kind of floating around and it can be packaged in a number of different ways. It can have envelopes or not be enveloped and, and a number of things. And if you get into really nitty gritty virus study, those things become important as to how you deal with them. But I think as producers, we just need to realize is this is some genetic information, some RNA or DNA that needs to work its way into a living organism so that it can reproduce. And I put on here, I think it, it has parasite-like activity because really if we, we understand parasites, I think we feel pretty good about the idea that, yeah, we know worms can get in and they steal nutrients and some of them drink blood and they create issues. And really that's kind of what these viruses are doing is they're coming in, they're just hijacking the cells. They're harder to see. We're not gonna open them up and find them. We can't just run a fecal, but they come in, they take over some systems and they use that animal to reproduce. And if we look at food supply issues, I think that's really important that we understand that they infect living organisms and cells, uh, not just <clears throat> anything. And as we talk about whether we look at meat and it goes through a conversion where it's no longer living cells. Uh, but again, these genetic codes just kind of go around, they hijack cells and use that cell to start producing more virus. So sustain their, their life cycle. The immune response, so we talked about a little bit of immune um, review, and it will be important as we talk about, so what's the likelihood of dealing with any disease? So should a coronavirus become an issue, or if we have to worry about how to deal with it, or how do we start to get immunity, or if we look at testing in the future, it, we understand how the immune system works. It may help us understand our test a little better. And so for immune responses, there's innate immune responses. And this is kind of the pre-programmed generic response your body has to any infection, foreign material, or disease. And it's going to send out and do certain things to try to beat down, kill that invading organism, virus, bacteria, fungus, whatever it is. And it's going to call in some help. Uh, and so we sometimes say that the innate immune response comes with the price of inflammation. And that's heat, pain, swelling, redness. So things we look at for infection or inflammation. And that's really the immune system maybe making a vessel leaky so that these immune fighting cells can get out into the area where it needs to be. Or uh, it comes with some heat that we raise the temperature that may be less ideal for those organisms. So it kind of has this generic response. Many times that may be good enough to stop infection, uh, but not always. And it's not very specific. That brings us to the second part or the adaptive immune system. And that's where the immune system becomes kind of specialized. It's gonna develop a response that is gonna be very specific to whatever the invading organism is, whether that again is a virus or a bacteria or a fungus. And so that takes time to develop. It has two components. It has an intracellular response and an extracellular response. And I think most of us are probably familiar or hear about that extracellular response. And those are usually antibodies and often they're measured in titers, basically a measure of how much antibody is present. And th there's a good and a, and a bad part to that. It's nice when we can measure those. It can give us some information about how much exposure or response is there. But often the intracellular response is very important or even maybe more important in some of these viral infections that those cells going out and maybe destroying that infected cell. So the virus takes it over, hijacks the machinery, starts producing virus. We've got to maybe kill that cell off to get rid of the virus. And these intracellular responses, or these T cell responses can be very difficult to measure. There's no great way to go out and say, oh, I have a great uh, T cell response. And so we often fall back to antibodies, but keep in mind that's only part 
And just because you have a low level of antibodies doesn't mean you didn't have a very robust adaptive intracellular response. And just because you maybe have super high levels of antibodies doesn't mean maybe that other arm was doing much. So we need to kind of realize the limitations of antibody titers, and that's often what we want to go to in disease monitoring. This adaptive or very specialized immune response takes at least 10 or 14 days to develop. So it takes some time for the body to say, here's my specific reaction. I'm going to be really uh, get into some specific part that tailors this to this disease, and it takes time for that to occur. And the body has to go through a number of processes. So when we see a, a new disease that enters into one of our herds or flocks, and we, you know, maybe at least with coronavirus, we kind of start to understand this a little bit better. We see a new virus nobody's seen before. Uh, it can take a while to have great responses. We see a disease that can cause uh, problems for much longer than we're used to. Hey, I didn't get a respiratory disease. I had it two or three days and I was better. That it takes time because we don't have that specific immune response that's ready to go. The upside of adaptive is also though, it does create some memory. And so the second or third time or down the road when this uh, infection comes back, we can have a very robust, fast reaction. But the first time it's gonna take some time. We can also split that immune response up a little bit into two other categories. One is active immunity and one is passive immunity. All the things we talked about before with the innate system um, and the adaptive are active processes. They're things the body is actively responding to and, and creating antibodies, creating uh, T cell responses. And it, again, can take some time. And we're comparing that to passive immunity. So this is really colostral immunity is where we first think about this, probably where we're most commonly exposed to it, that when a baby hits the ground, and it gets that first milk, it receives antibodies from its mother. It didn't do any work to develop those. It didn't have any part in that. It just gets some of this protection given to it. Uh, other places we may run into these passive immunities uh, may be tetanus anatoxin. So if you haven't vaccinated for tetanus, you're going to do some castrations or you're doing tail docking, that you may give tetanus anatoxin Again, the animal did nothing to develop that response. It's being given these antitoxin molecules to help fight it, but there was nothing it did to try to help get that immune response ready. Uh, others might be plasma and blood transfusions. And we've heard maybe this talked a little bit about with people in coronavirus, <clears throat> probably where we most likely see in a livestock, at least where I dealt with it as a veterinarian, was with horses, that if these foals did not get good uh, colostrum exposure or consumption, and they didn't have adequate immunity, we would give them plasma. Basically a liquid portion of blood that doesn't have the cells, but it carries the antibodies and these other cellular components and can provide protection. And so it's just another way that we may be able to provide protection to animals if they can't respond themselves. Probably not very practical for most livestock species. The upside of passive immunities are, however, they're available immediately. So if you need help now, you don't have to wait on the body to go through its response, but you do have to have a source where to get that help. But you can give those and get immediate help and protection. So that's kind of the immune system overview, pretty brief. But again, we have some active components, some that are generic and initial, some that become specified over time, and we can compare those to those we kind of get as freebies or giving us help. Um, if we look a little bit more as far as just response to what COVID-19 is or the sudden acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, uh, as we've probably heard, and you can see places, it's a beta coronavirus. There are a number of different types, different spikes and proteins you could get into. But when we look historically and talking about coronaviruses, there's at least four coronaviruses that are identified as, as common human cold viruses. Um, and there are several in other species. And I have a slide coming up here in just a minute that shows a few of the others. Uh, they put this chart that will come up together, I think, when the first SARS coronavirus came up in like 2002. Um, but on the other column over here, and I've got to move a couple of things so I can see just a little better. So at the moment is, is we know that we're a number of species have coronaviruses already. Um, 
we mentioned the ones that occur in people as far as human cold viruses. Uh, this beta coronavirus, again, they think may come from bats and bats and rodents have the largest number of these beta coronaviruses of any other species that we know of. So it makes sense, maybe that's where it come from because they tend to have a lot of different coronaviruses just within those animals <clears throat> at any time. Pigs have a couple of coronaviruses, the PED virus, uh, we seen in just a few years ago come in and make uh, some really significant problems for the swine industry where we were having small pigs die at a pretty rapid rate. Again, it was a novel new virus. It's a virus that had shown up in, I think in Asia and Russia and some different areas, uh, maybe in the 70s and 80s, but it was new to the US. There was no immunity to it. There wasn't a certain level of protection animals had developed. And as a result, it caused huge problems and issues in the swine industry. Uh, TGE, another swine coronavirus, um, was a big issue in those uh, early time periods, maybe in the 80s, where we saw that be a big issue, and it still breaks out occasionally. Um, cats have coronaviruses, and then we have dealt with for years. Cats have some very interesting responses, um, some unique things they do. One that's just kind of a generic enteric virus that typically isn't too big, but they can get some other ones that become feline infectious peritonitis and do some really unique and odd things. Uh, there is a bovine coronavirus. We know dogs have a coronavirus. So coronaviruses aren't new and they've been around uh, for some time. But in this case, we've had one that's kind of crossed over and has become an issue from an animal species and it developed enough characteristics to be a problem in people. And, and again, there's more info to come on that, but some of that may be important in deciding what animals may be at risk and what animals may not be. Um, but again, coronaviruses certainly have been around and are in a number of our species already, and, and we know those exist. Um, here is that table, I move over here, that, that I mentioned after the first SARS coronavirus and, and a lot of information was kind of sought, just showing some of the different coronaviruses that were listed. Certainly there are many more than this, <clears throat> and showing some of the primary hosts it affected. So the ones in people, we had ones in pigs, cats, dogs, rabbits, humans, mouse, turkeys, chickens, uh, the palm civet, the raccoon dog, the raccoon dog with cars, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 has been a likely candidate to think where it still occurs. We know mink recently, and we'll talk a little bit about, seem to be very susceptible and have some unique properties. And I talked about where they occur. So again, we, we've seen a lot of these coronaviruses. Some of them have, have went multiple places, so they're not new. This one's just new that it's unique to our, our species and group. And so there's a couple of theories about how it showed up, and, and I don't know that they're terribly important for us just to discuss, but we'll mention for some completeness, uh, that either this virus was able to infect people and it finally just got that exposure it needed, or it got into the human population and it changed just enough to become what we call virulent or aggressive or able to cause disease. So it was already here and then it just developed a little bit to create some disease. So there's a couple ideas of how that may have occurred. And as I show here, usually they think there's an intermediate host. So maybe it wasn't directly from the bat to the person, but there's another animal species that may have helped with that movement and made that exposure more likely. Uh, with the original SARS coronavirus, the civet was thought to be that intermediate host. <clears throat> you might be familiar, I think in 2012 or 13, there was Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is another coronavirus, or camels tend to be that, that intermediate host. Uh, and that may, again, provide some importance if they can figure that out as to what of our animal species may be more susceptible. Um, current information, and again, some of this is pretty new and there's some unpublished, but looked at ferrets, cats, and golden Syrian hamsters to kind of be good models of disease. And we may find those important that scientists are looking for what species can we get to show signs of disease and maybe let this virus replicate, keeping in mind, there's usually very specific circumstances that they've allowed these animals or gotten these animals to show evidence of the disease. Like they have exposed them under very unique circumstances that may not be common in nature, but to find out could they serve as a good model so that we can study this without just having to use the human information. And maybe the more comforting of that is um, chickens, ducks, mice, pigs, and dogs. So I highlighted chickens and pigs there but those livestock species did not appear to be good, 
models for disease. They either didn't acquire the disease well, they didn't replicate well, it didn't serve as a good model. Thus, we can kind of feel comfortable that those species are not going to be huge concerns. There's pretty limited information looking at any challenge of small ruminants or cattle with the disease. I think there was one study where cows were challenged a little bit. They may have got a few to convert, but there's just not a lot of info at this time. But again, at least some of these species do not appear to be good models and probably are not going to be huge concerns. Time will, will tell, maybe. Mink have been the different one, and while that's maybe not a very common livestock, we know there's some in the northern part of the U.S., uh, but mink do appear to be able to pick the virus up, and it does appear that that virus can actually replicate or develop new virus, and it can infect other mink and maybe back to people. So mink appear to maybe be that one host now that presents some risk uh, of the animal species we know about, or at least maybe the biggest risk that's been identified at this time. Again, from what we know now, uh, researcher studies with surveys, there's little to no evidence that domestic animals are easily infected. And that doesn't say they can't be, but they're not easily infected. So they don't necessarily pick this disease up very readily. Um, in a research setting, again, they're really exposing these to unusual circumstances. When we put these into common everyday occurrences, they're not that, not that readily infected. We do know that there have been documented cases of cats, of dogs, uh, of mink that have shown susceptibility and have picked up the disease. But based on the number of people and the number of cases, certainly it doesn't appear that many. The question there again may become how much looking have we done? I think that's been limited to this point. Resources have really been focused on just dealing with the human aspect of it. So as we go along in time, we may start to look for signs of disease, and we may talk about that in a little bit, what some of those tests may be. But again, not a lot of evidence that most of our animal species have easily contractable disease. And, and keep in mind with these pets, most of these pets are gonna have a lot more interaction, a lot more close interaction with us than most of our livestock species are. And again, when infection did occur in a lot of these animals, they had very close contact. Most had very mild signs of disease. Um, some didn't, a lot didn't show any disease at all. We may have two animals in the same household, one showed nothing and one showed some. And we didn't really see evidence when we look at the cat and the dogs that we were seeing evidence of transmission amongst the pets. So we had a few of those questions we brought up at the beginning. Could the animal get the disease? Could it actually show signs? And then could it transmit it? And most of those did not show evidence that transmitting it to other animals of the same species, let alone to others. So again, pretty limited concern at this point for most animals. That being said, we do know some can get and show some disease, so there's not a lack of risk, but it's fairly low. And I think as we come back and apply that to livestock, again, without some of those very specific circumstances that we're getting a lot less exposure to them on a very regular basis. And so here are some of those questions again, move this around, can it infect my animals? So at this point in time, we know some cats seem to be more susceptible than other pets, but it's fairly low. Dogs, even less. We just don't have a lot of studies, but there's really not any evidence out there at this time to suggest that livestock are gonna be susceptible that the virus can go in and replicate in them. And if so, are they really gonna show any evidence of that disease? And Again, beyond there, the ability to transmit it to other animals in the herd uh, or to other species that may be around. Again, no evidence that that's a huge concern for our livestock at this time. And again, just kind of a, a repeat of some of that information uh, from the CDC that, that came out. And again, mink provide a unique issue, but as far as our livestock species, really, again, very, very limited concern. I kind of want to touch a little on the, on the product safety. So I think as, as livestock producers, uh, that has to be a concern for us. So not only are our animals going to be at risk or, or what's their health, but what does that do to our products? And I think some of this has been driven by, we've had a lot of concerns and discussion for a while of meat processing facilities having high numbers of workers testing positive. A lot of that was thought to be attributed to this, to just the close contact and close association that they worked in, uh, maybe the environment, which 
is commonly cool and may have a high humidity uh, to try to help some of those meat uh, effects be there. Um, but keep in mind again, that if a worker does have coronavirus or would be shedding, that it really is probably viewed more as a contaminant issue. That again, for a virus to come in and be active, it has to infect living cells. And most uh, of these exposure are happening during the conversion of these animal products into food products. So especially in the meat industry, as we move from muscle to meat during that conversion, those cells are dying and no longer alive. And so we're not gonna find a virus that's able to go in and use that cell to reproduce. The cell's not living at that point, the virus isn't going to be transmitted or picked up. Uh, so I think there's really limited concern as far as meat products go. Uh, contaminants could be there, but again, if we use good food handling methods, um, we use washing well, we're limiting our contact, we're heating and cooking appropriately, and so we can follow some of those guidelines from, from CDC and food handling agencies that we should be feel real confident that we're uh, able to mitigate that risk for us from a food supply source. And as again, as we look at milk and dairy, we don't see evidence that our animals are necessarily infected or any evidence that they're shedding. And so again, I think we have very limited concern and risk for those products at this time. Certainly, we can see more concern um, with some of these uh, pets or, or guardian or working animals may be there. Again, those seem to be low, but that's gonna be, I think, a little higher risk. Um, but again, it's not a huge concern. Probably the biggest issue really comes down to workforce and employees. So people are where we're seeing a lot of the issues exhibited as far as disease. And so it's maybe trying to, what can we do to mitigate that we don't get workers or people needing to do the caretaking and, and work on the production end from getting it and interrupting that supply of work or a process. As an individual producer, you know, if you're not affected and you're the only employee, that, that's not an issue. As we move into bigger farms, uh, more employees, I think that risk certainly goes up. And then the question just becomes, if you as a sole caretaker would get it, does it affect your ability to care for those animals? Uh, but again, that seems to be a bigger concern right now than does the animal infective issue. Perhaps if it points out anything for us, I think that it's if you don't really think about or use a biosecurity protocol or a program or have a plan, uh, it's probably a great reminder of now is the time. Um, good biosecurity is gonna limit the entrance of problematic organisms. Um, you know, we may use isolation, we may use testing. Um, if we find problems, how do we try to start limiting that? Um, can we be proactive with vaccines? Um, I, those are the things that having that in place now may prepare us. So even though the virus does not appear to be a huge issue for our animals at this time, if we have good biosecurity, that should really help to limit exposure they may get outside of ourselves. So are we limiting visitors and traffic? Do we restrict them to certain areas? Do we limit the interaction others are gonna have with our animals? The better our biosecurity, the less likely this or any other disease or problem is gonna be able to get entrance and, and become an issue for our livestock species. And so I'm gonna take some time then to kind of promote, if you haven't heard, uh, the Secure Sheep and Wool Program. Um, it's developed a lot at Iowa State uh, in cooperation with the American Sheep Industry. Um, they have put this website out. It has a ton of good information to really help you set up a biosecurity protocol. And the theory of it is that it's, it's there to prevent when a foreign animal disease, so disease we don't currently have here, might gain entrance. Foot and mouth disease is usually the disease brought up, our big concern. We expect it to behave a lot like we've seen with coronavirus and the, the pandemic issue that this new virus that we've never seen, that our animals haven't got any immunity to and exposure to previously shows up. It will spread very rapidly. It's going to have a high rate of infection. Um, and so the idea behind the plan is you don't have to have this super secure, everything is, is super detailed and protective right now today, but I have a plan in place so that if these issues show up, I can suddenly institute a much more restrictive plan and try to limit that. So I have a plan now that may work 
and it may be much more open. I may not be quite as concerned about how much separation do I have from my neighbor's flock? Uh, does the feed truck have to get onto my property? But I have a plan in place and have identified those things so that if a severe issue shows up, I can suddenly really start to limit traffic and try to keep any of those exposures out and really protect not only my flock, but myself and my business from some of those adverse effects. And so I'd really recommend if you haven't heard or seen or been there, look at that Secure Sheep and Wool program. It's at securesheepandwool.org. They have papers to help you identify risk areas, to understand what a line of separation is, uh, all these things you can work and go through if you have a veterinarian you work with, if you have an extension agent or other professionals, they may be able to help you fill these out and, and be prepared. The benefits may not only be, does it help keep diseases out of your operation and help keep the continuity of your business running, but should a disease show up, and we've seen this occur with diseases like avian influenza, they sometimes will lock down a region. The disease showed up, we're gonna really limit any movement of animals or animal products within a, a fairly wide radius. And then if we feel like we start to get a handle on what's going on, we may start to slowly release some of these products to be going if we have assurances that they're not present on one farm or location. And if you can document some of these biosecurity measures that you have in place, that you have a written plan, you may get to move a little sooner. So you may find a release and an ability to keep business going is a little sooner and a little easier for you to come up with. In addition to the fact, maybe they helped you keep the disease out so you don't get in that um, lockdown area. And I think that's about all I had as far as the presentation itself. So I'll stop with my screen share and see what kind of confusion I have caused. Actually, Dr. Boffman, uh, I have zero questions in the chat. So I don't know if that means that people are scared or you just did that good a job. Or asleep. Uh, it is lunchtime, you know, that postprandial nap sometimes comes in. Only if they ate a turkey sandwich. So um, I guess at this time, anybody that's listening, if you guys have any questions, you wanna uh, drop them in the chat and uh, we can get them to Dr. Bachman for him to answer. If they don't have a lot, I guess the other thing, and I, and I didn't have the slide here that I've had a few, is we talk about future testing options. Um, you know, PCR testing and antibody testing are probably the two primary things to look at at this point. Um, PCR testing is where you look for presence of the virus. So you may go around and, and pull a sample and say, are we able to find evidence of the virus? And it works by amplifying or creating copies of that genetic code. Um, so there's some risk with it. If you're not sick right now, it's not going to tell you, is the virus there? Was it there two weeks ago? Have you ever seen it? It's just looking for, is it present today? And it's got some faults. It can pick up contamination. So if you swab your cat and you cough on it and you had it, there, there can be some reasons we got to be careful. Antibodies are the other one we mentioned. And again, the upside of an antibody is they may run those tests across our animal species and say, boy, was there any evidence that we have antibodies to coronavirus? So is there any indication at some point this virus was infected in these animals and, and creating issue? The tough part of antibodies is it tells you no evidence necessarily of how significant the disease was, did it cause any signs, won't really tell you when it was, it just tells you you were exposed. So those will probably be the things we look at if we do any testing down the road. All I've got in the comments right now is that, you know, you did a great job. It's good info. So I, I guess pat, pat I yourself on the back. I have a question for Dr. Bachman. Uh, what care, special care, should be taking the farmers now during the winter, especially with the very, very cold days? Uh, Just for livestock in general? Uh, yes, uh, especially for small ruminants and the, the, the special care, especially for all these things about the COVID-19. And well, and, and, and we may move those into two parts. And so if we look at it as it relates to coronavirus, I think 
you know, for me now is I'm probably not taking any super special precautions for my animals as far as coronavirus goes, but in, in my little farm, I'm not having a ton of direct exposure. I'm out with those animals, we're feeding them, uh, but we're not in close contact. I'm not spending a bunch of time standing right there in their face. So one, if you have some pet animals, and I know especially I think on the goat side of life, we have a lot of goats that are more pet goats. So I have one goat, um, my wife's working too much now to ever go see him much, but she kind of calls it the therapy goat. So you get to go out and pet on him. But if you have some animals that you're in close contact with, you know, being aware, if you have any clinical signs of, of coronavirus, just like we'd recommend with pets, you probably really want to limit that. Just limit that exposure. Don't run the risk of, even though it doesn't look like these animals are likely overly affected by coronavirus, you know, don't run the risk in the exposure. Um, if I run a business where I'm doing some more intimate work, like in milking operations, if I happen to be there or, or what have you, um, I'm going to try to make sure me or the people working probably take a few precautions. We're going to have gloves. We're probably going to have some masks occasionally just to make sure we're trying to limit either the contamination or that exposure. Again, if we're really involved in them. If I've got goats and I do goat yoga, um, I'm going to be pretty cautious about again, making a few changes there. If we get outside of coronavirus, you know, just looking, it's getting cold and, and weather is, again, just trying to make sure we have all those necessary things. As we get into cold weather, water usually gets to be the, the biggest word, worry. So as a veterinarian, um, wintertime, one of the big calls we always get concerns about is that water freezes up and people aren't paying attention and animals go without water. Um, but making sure you've got adequate housing, adequate space and feed available, making sure those animals are healthy. So should they be challenged with any disease that they're as, as ready as they can to prevent those issues would be great. You've got two questions in the chat. So people are getting brave. Yeah. Um, the first question says, um, how do you know that you have coronavirus rather than some other respiratory infection? Because those signs um, are very similar. Well, one, luckily for me, I'm not a human physician. So I tell you, you probably need to consult your physician to be number one. Um, and like I said, without a positive test. So if I'm looking at an animal virus, if I don't have the test, I can't say. Uh, but as a person, it's, you're going to have to contact your physician, discuss it with them. Um, and really for the animal part, I think is if you have concerns about anything, just take a few extra precautions to limit that exposure. Okay. Uh, thank you. The next question is, uh, will testing for livestock be more accurate than the ones that are already being done for CL in sheep um, or the COVID test in humans where there is an incidence of false negatives and false positives? And, and probably really good questions. And I, I think we don't know a couple of those answers. Now, the CL testing in sheep, um, depending on what you're looking at, if you're looking at culturing it and telling it's a CL bacteria, that one's pretty good. Uh, but if you're looking at the blood test, uh, if it's not more accurate than that, we probably don't need to worry about running it um, to some degree. To be honest, that, that CL negative or, um, ELISA test doesn't bring a lot of value for me. Um, I guess if it's positive, it is maybe where it does. Um, I would expect those tests would be better. Um, but really, there's still just a bunch of that to be unknown. PCR tests are probably what we're going to rely on for those animals that appear sick. Those tests appear to be pretty good. Um, it looks like on the human side, though, there's certainly some false negative rates, so they're not going to be perfect. But to be honest, very few of the tests we have currently are. And if we start looking at disease testing, um, it's going to be working with your veterinarian or your state official or working with some extension professionals, understanding what are the strengths and weaknesses of the test as we know them and how do those apply to your situation. Okay. We'll kind of skip around that a little bit, I guess. Okay, great answer. Thanks, Dr. Rothman. Yeah. All right, we still have a little bit of time if anybody's got any questions. Um, I am going to go ahead and throw our, um, our assessment tool, our survey monkey in the chat. So um, if you guys have a moment to go ahead and um, fill that out, it is actually extremely helpful for us to make this program valuable for you. Um, so I'm going to put that in the chat. Okay, wait a minute. Back up to one of your questions. Um, 
diagnostic symptoms, how do you know if it's coronavirus or another respiratory? Um, she meant in animals, not in people. So do you have any additional well, wisdom to add there? And, and it's gonna fall a lot to the same. Unfortunately, you may not. Um, one of the big things we, we might look for, so if this, let's say coronavirus does become an issue for, for animals, since it's a new novel virus, you would be more suspicious of something new if you have a really high number of animals that start to show the problem. So just like if we have a foreign animal disease come in of some kind, the concern is our animals have never seen it, so they have no real specific immunity to it. And they're probably gonna at least have some form. It may be a very short, it may be not that severe, but you're gonna have a bunch of them. So when we see these problems, whether it, it's any type of virus that comes in that's new or any infection that comes into an animal population, if it's new, often we're gonna see a large number of them. So if you wean uh, goats and maybe you're expecting to treat 10% uh, of them for respiratory pneumonia problems a year, that may not be uncommon. If one year suddenly you're out and this year you notice you've got 60 or 70% of them, that's something new and, and probably different. Something changed. Either there is a, a problem in the health of those animals in general that we overlooked something. Was it feed? Was it water? Was it housing? Or do we have a new virus issue? And that would be a good indicator of we need to start investigating what this may be. For coronavirus testing, none is recommended as a rule at this time. But if circumstances arise for where corona is a concern, so whether it's a cat, a dog, a cow, whatever, um, state officials are going to be involved. But typically what they're looking for is, does this present as a normal virus that we would expect? And do we work it up for an infection that is common? So if it's cows, did we look for IBR, red nose? Did we look for BVD, parainfluenza, BRSV? Did we look for Mannheimian pneumonia? If we did all that and we can find no reason, and especially if we have a really high number of infected individuals, that may be an indicator of, should we be looking for something new? So livestock and pet species for me now, if they show some respiratory, if I hear hoof beats, I'm looking for horses. What are common things we typically see as respiratory issues for those animals? But if we find those aren't there, then we may have to begin a discussion of should we be looking for something new or different like coronavirus? Okay, thank you. Um, there is a comment in the chat. I'm not sure if it's really a question, but it certainly is important. Um, the greatest effect that people have seen from the virus is the cancellation of either livestock shows or sales. So I don't know if you have any, any comment. Yeah, right. And, and it kind of goes back to that, that idea that it's the workforce issue and it's the human component that really has been the big issue for us at this point in the livestock industry to deal with. So while the show thing's unfortunate, some of the sales are, are a big problem. If anything, again, I would keep that biosecurity idea in mind um, that anything you can do to limit some of these things and maybe get yourself some early release. Unfortunately, um, the human component is probably always going to be there and and we'll just try to have to figure out how to work our way through that. Thank you, Dr. Rothman. I don't see any more comments. We've got maybe five more minutes at the most, if anybody wants to drop anything else into the chat. Uh, Dr. Rothman, I want to do thank you for your time. This has been very interesting. Um, it's been very informative. It's been surprisingly easy to understand. So, uh, my compliments to you yeah, and you're getting you're getting thumbs up and and people are are, are appreciating so i'm like, not I, i'm I, not I, alone thank you guys for having me and, and really i think the big takeaway is right now uh, i i think we're, we're pretty low concern so take care of yourselves be cautious where you can don't expose your animals to you know maybe don't kiss your cow uh for a while just make sure we don't provide that and for the most part we can feel pretty comfortable i think with where we're at right now we'll see what time brings for us uh, Reese, uh, thank you so much for, for your time and for your talking. And uh, so just to say to uh, the people that uh, here at Lincoln, you, you are able to help uh, any, any question, they may call, uh, email to you, and, and just to be sure that uh, we are taking care of uh, everybody. And uh, we want to to make an announcement about uh, our next uh, talk, 
that will be about uh, uh, marketing opportunities for uh, for small ruminants. Uh, this will be on December uh, 12th and will be uh, Jennifer Lutz that will be talking with us and also with the small comments of uh, David Millenton. So we thank you so much for your time and uh, answer that uh, survey that uh, Amy is uh, telling you to answer and, and send us your email so we may uh, get for you a certificate for this participation. Uh, thank you so much and, and until the next. Have a good Thanksgiving, everybody.